But the aim of this morning is to have a rich discussion about where preventive health needs to go, given the National Women's Health Strategy and the importance placed on preventive health. Some of you will know that that's a substantial part of my work and business now, and I am convinced of the importance and the value of preventive health. But it's a hard argument for us to make in this place, Canberra, for reasons that could probably make several PhD theses very interesting. We have to be smart about making preventive health the most important thing that policymakers think about because we, are, we have moved from the 18th and 19th century where we needed health care to keep people alive, resulting from trauma and infectious disease. We now need health care to keep people healthy. And that's a big shift for the professions, for the policymakers, and even the consumers. So today's discussion is going to be really, really important. Some of you will have attended, and I'm operating a new thing here, Ah, oh, sorry, too far, back. Some of you will have attended a forum on preventive health that was hosted by Jean Hales last month. <clears throat> yes, it is still last month. In which the basic issues were discussed and the discussion for today was set up. That forum had four questions. You will by now be familiar with these because each forum that we've talked about so far had the same questions. And they will be the questions we will ask you to consider during this session and in this afternoon's closing session. What is happening that can be built on? What can't we do without collaborating with others who matter as much as we do? What actions can we do now, take now? And who else do we need to involve in this? So those are four dominating questions for us to think on. That forum considered those questions and you have a summary of the comments of the forum on your chair, hopefully by now on your lap. So I'm not going to go through them in detail here. But as you listen to the speakers and you join into the discussion with the panellists, keep these in mind because we're going to ask you to add to them to think of other things that haven't been thought of, to critique what's there, because we are building up a base of thinking, information, and leadership that we want to work with from here on. So I won't go through this, but that you can see that each of these questions has some pretty solid comment arising from the first forum. As I said, I won't go through it, you can see it on your lap, but these are all issues that we need to take forward and make some decisions about. Are these are the things we're going to campaign for, work together for, invest our effort in, or what or else? What else? And the actions that we can take now are really very interesting to read because we do need to come out of this symposium with some energy and some direction about the first next steps. Question, who else needs to be involved is a really important one. We do have to think about who we need to work with, engage with, bond with when necessary, and bring into the circle when they're not there now in order to achieve what we need to achieve. I should have introduced myself, I'm sorry. I sort of take it for granted after a day. I'm Rosemary Calder, I work for Victoria University and I run a health policy think tank called the Australian Health Policy Collaboration and my business has become very much preventive health because given a mandate by that institution to lift health and education outcomes in Australia with a particular focus on chronic disease, the more you investigate what needs to be done to lift health outcomes the more you head down a one-way street called prevention. We lead the world in treatment. You heard the minister today talk about the many achievements in cancers and in other chronic diseases. We absolutely lead the world in helping people survive with conditions, many of which can be prevented. And that's the information we've got to get across. 
It's great that we spend the money when we need to to give people quality of life with a disease that they have to live with. But if we could shift just a bit of that into prevention, we could reduce what needs to be spent at the other end, we could maintain the quality of that and improve it, and we could move to become a healthy nation as we think we are, but are not. Our presenters today are Karen Hammenberg from Monash University, Robert Williams, the University of Melbourne, and panellists will not include Sandra Eads as she has been unable to attend, but her place will be taken. And I've just gone blank, sorry. It's a deep problem when you're trying to do too many things at once. Karen. Robin. Robin Williams, that's right. Sorry, two travel fellows, my mistake. Robin Williams, who is a Jean Hales travel fellow, will be presenting on behalf of both Sandra and herself. And to do that, we're going to slightly or change the order so that Robin will speak, will present Sandra's presentation and then speak to hers before we move on through the program. So let me welcome Robin and apologise again. Her expertise includes extensive experience in Aboriginal community-based health research and her current work includes a postdoc looking at the development of the FASD, fetal alcohol syndrome, workforce training and interventions for children and families. In presenting Sandra Ede's work, she will be talking about what Sandra has done in her career. She's made outstanding contributions to the epidemiology of Indigenous child health in Australia. She's provided national leadership in Indigenous health research. She was Australia's first Aboriginal medical doctor to be awarded a doctorate of philosophy. And she currently leads a major study of Aboriginal as adult, adolescent health and at RCT of a multi-component nurse-led intervention to prevent dementia among Indigenous Australians. So Robin, welcome. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Um, I acknowledge the traditional owners of this country uh, and their families. Um, I also uh, have to acknowledge um, Professor Sandra Eads, who, um, as you've just heard, has been a trail bl blazer and um, also a mentor of mine. And um, she's somebody that I've known for a very, very long time. And um, it's been a privilege to work on this project, um, The Next Generation, um, which, as you can see, looks at the age cohort of 10 to 24. Now, the reason that Sandra wanted to, to look at this age group is that this is the age cohort uh, that miss out the most in terms of resources um, and um, service delivery. So let me tell you, it's been a very interesting project um, to be involved with. And um, my position has been to lead uh, the West Australian team. So what we know about chronic disease burden for uh, Aboriginal people is that it's 64% of the total disease burden, 70% uh, of the gap. Um, we know that diabetes continues to be a significant problem um, for our population. We're 3.5 times the risk of diabetes and um, diabetes in women is impacting at multiple points uh, in the life course, uh, emerging at 20 years earlier on average. So the changes that we need to see, we're, we're of course not seeing um, as quickly as, as we need to. So um, here is uh, some of the preliminary results and so in the, um, what you see here is the 10 to 14 um, age group and you see 37% have, have been um, the result of for obesity. And uh, for 15 to 17 years, again, you see the result of 36%. And um, 18 to 24, you can see that result. So um, the gaps, uh, continue, to, continue to be data about the onset and progression of chronic diseases. Assessment of risk and protective factors um, and data 
again for this, for this age group. So the research in questions included this. What is the distrib distribution, sorry, of, now I'm not a medical person, <laughs> cardiometabolic risk factors among Aboriginal females and males aged 10 to 24 years? And what is the social, cultural and environmental context associated with both increased risks and healthy outcomes? And the aims of the study was to understand these factors and determine future health and well-being for Aboriginal youth and to inform the development of health services and health and social policy with the specific aims to um, explore the views of young people and to establish a, a <clears throat> longitudinal cohort of young Aboriginal people to examine their health pathways. So what, um, how, how the uh, project is designed with three sites, as you can see here, so you've got New South Wales, um, Central Australia, and us over here in the West. And um, so data collection commenced in, in January of last year. And so what you can also see is that we've been working very closely with Aboriginal community-based agencies um, at each of these sites. So um, this is involved uh, for us in WA, as you can see, working closely with the Southwest Aboriginal Medical Service, uh, Durbel Urigan. So we've been working in very close partnership. So the data collection, it's been quite a, um, for someone, I've been working in the area of research for 10 years, and it's been a challenging, um, challenging project, but also very rewarding project because um, what we were doing is, is quite intensive. We were uh, undertaking the survey with the young people and then also um, running basic clinic checks. The other thing we also did, and you won't see the results yet in uh, this presentation, is we also included, or Sandra also included, importantly, a, um, a, a survey on the health of parents and carers of the children. And then what happened at the end when they'd finished answering questions about their health, they would then answer questions on, the, um, on their child. So this is going to be very interesting when we see those results. So with the um, survey, you could see on the left-hand side um, under measures, the questions were around those topics. So we were asking about sexual health, um, tobacco, alcohol and drugs, social determinants, cultural engagement, uh, mental and physical health. Uh, on the clinical side, um, we were taking their blood pressure, their weights, um, and um, checking for uh, their, sorry, doing a, um, a lipids check. Most of the kids um, were, most of the kids were quite okay with us taking their bloods as well. What you can see here is um, where we are at right now in terms of data collection. So you can see there, there's the results for um, Central Australia, Alice Springs, New South Wales, uh, and us in WA. So in total, we have, um, we have surveyed 1,032 children, young people, and you can see there the parent carers, 466. And then the bottom table is the clinic measures. And you can also see uh, the results of, of the clinics. Okay, so here are some of, the, um, some of the results. So in total, we had 525 uh, females so far take part uh, in the project. And you can, okay, and you can see there, 400 males. Something that's really interesting too, just to mention this, is that in my experience as a researcher, it's always easier to engage females. So I think that's actually quite a positive thing. Um, and that's at all ages. That's in both for young people 
and um, with adults as well. So harder to engage the males. Okay, so you can see there that the median age was 13. So there you can see the, um, the spread of age and always a little bit more difficult to engage the older age group. Okay, and so to conduct the survey, on average it would take um, children, and now this is really depending on their literacy, um, literacy levels, um, it could take anything from 30, uh, 30 minutes to an hour to complete the survey, and the clinic, clinic checks only took about 30 minutes. Okay, so here you can see the results for the, uh, again, clinic measures. And um, what's of concern, of course, is everything highlighted in yellow. Uh, and again, here is more clinical results. And of course, if Sandra was here, she would spend a lot more time talking about this. Okay, and these are clinic results based on gender. So females, we can see there, um, again, these, these, um, these rates are quite concerning. But really important data to inform us um, in prevention. So the next steps is um, uh, data cleaning finalising um, data collection in a cohort. Um, we are going to be finishing up very, very soon. We're in the last, um, last few months. Um, you can see there we'll, we will also be describing the social, cultural, environmental context um, associated um, with increased risk and healthy outcomes. The other thing I also want to mention is that in doing the data collection, um, we have gone to country towns in the southwest, um, so we haven't just done the collection in Perth. Um, we've been to quite a few of the towns. And it doesn't matter where we've done the data collection. One of the things that I just want to highlight is the number of, um, the number of carers who are actually grandparents and who are raising young children and, um, and also, the other thing I want to just highlight is the number of grandparents who are quite young. And something that I'm seeing in my generation is that our grand grandparents these days in our community are actually starting to raise far more grandchildren um, than what I observed as a, as a child growing up. So I'll give you an example. Um, there's been times where I've surveyed um, grandparents and they're raising as much as six children. You know, so that, um, so often they're not raising one or two grandchildren, they're raising, um, you know, uh, up, to f up to four um, and more grannies. So the importance and the implications, um, so this information for the communities involved I was speaking to Sandra recently, and one of the things we're going to do, the translation um, back to the community is really important. And uh, so we will be developing um, plain language uh, translation. The communities, too, have been very interested um, in, the, in the results. And um, they've also requested the results to help them with developing programs um, and services uh, back in their own communities. It's a valuable data resource on Indigenous adolescent health and uh, it's going to inform, of course, the development of health services um, and health and service social policy for Aboriginal youth 10 to, 20, 10 to 24 years of age. And here are some of the photos of our beautiful, beautiful young people um, that we've had the privilege the privilege to work with, and um, and their grandparents and their and their parents. So it's been, um, like I said, it's been a very humbling project. 
to be involved with and um, especially working with, it's my first time of working with um, young people as young, uh, under the age of 16. So um, it's, been, it's been very special. And acknowledgements are all of these wonderful people up here on this slide. There you have the uh, people who are involved in Alice Springs, uh, Sydney, um, in Perth. Here are the uh, other team members who work alongside us. So to do a, a, a project of this size takes, it's a huge um, team effort. And there's lots of learning, learning that you do um, when you go along and you work, work on, a, on a project such as this. So thank you very much. So I chose to go straight into uh, my, next, my um, next presentation, which is the FASD. This is actually what I did my PhD on. Okay, so where's the starting point? The starting point when we look at FASD is, um, is importantly, recognition. So in recognising that we are, unfortunately, 15 years behind countries such as US and Canada, is it's really critical to, to recognise that for decades, women and girls have lived with, struggled with, undiagnosed FASD. They remain an invisible population that health and all systems are failing. So, like I said, they're undiagnosed, they're unrecognised, and also, we also need to consider women who are the carers of children and adults with undiagnosed FASD. It's a universal story that um, women in these roles as carers also neglect their own health. So, what you have, what we also need to be aware of is that the Australian Diagnostic Tool has only been around now for about four years. We also need to be aware that um, the diagnostic tool is only up until, the, uh, up until 18 years of age, okay? And um, what we also need to recognise is that those with FASD, whether you're Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal, are walking with chronic adversity daily. So the work that you've got a combination of adversity and unrecognised disability. This is a deadly combination. Now, and I've put up there Joyce Clark. Joyce Clark is a very recent story, and if you have a look at, um, she's only recently passed away uh, in Geraldton, and um, what they found is that um, there were in, when she became involved in the criminal justice system, a psychiatric report um, was undertaken highlighting that she most definitely had FASD, but no opportunity was, um, there was no access to diagnosis. So the scope of um, concern and urgency, this is what we know, and this is globally, this is, just doesn't apply to Australia. The FASD is overrepresented in out of home care and the criminal justice system. So, the Banksy Hill study that was undertaken in Perth found a prevalence rate of 30 to 40 per cent. Now, this is the highest prevalence rate in the world. We also know that this is not just an Aboriginal problem, but what I'm going to explain in, in some slides coming is how it's different for us. 50% of Australian pregnancies are unplanned. We've already heard that stat yesterday. Binge drinking is highest in females aged 18 to 29 years of age. 30% of women have reported that they drink alcohol during pregnancy. Women more highly educated are more likely to continue drinking alcohol during pregnancy. And in Western Australia, in uh, this research done by Colvin, 40% of drinking alcohol during pregnancy was initiated by the male partner. So this is, this is absolutely a topic that we have to bring men along with this conversation. When I asked that same question to Aboriginal men in the southwest, 
the response was 27%. So the definition of FASD uh, is uh, it's a diagnostic term used to describe impacts on the brain and body of individuals prenatally exposed to alcohol. FASD is a lifelong disability. Individ individuals with FASD will experience some degree of challenges in their daily living and need support with motor skills, physical health, learning, memory, attention, communication, emotional regulation, and social skills to reach their best potential. Each individual with FASD is unique and has areas of both strengths and challenges. So we also have heard a lot over, over this past, um, over this conference, the impact of trauma. So trauma naturally goes hand in hand with um, the end result for a lot of our families. And FASD has been, un like I said previously, FASD has been unrecognised for decades. And with families struggling to understand the challenges in the children that they are raising. A diagnosis is a catalyst for support and intervention, and it's gold standard. So chronic trauma and crisis living is part of the ongoing landscape contributing to a poverty trap. And those populations living in poverty are 16 times more likely to have a higher prevalence of FASD. The impact of FASD, um, you may have seen this um, before, is irreversible brain damage. Uh, you can see here uh, cognitive functions, language problems, and risk of early mortality. If we don't do anything and if we don't put supports in place, we have what we call the secondary disabilities, and these include ongoing problems with school, uh, engagement in the criminal justice system, 90% will develop mental health problems, alcohol drug and drug misuse, inappropriate sexual behaviour. In terms of prevention, the majority, there's a lot of literature on this, the majority of those with FASD will have comorbidity, okay? And here is a list of some of the other conditions that those with FASD live with. So it's really important to have a, fa a diagnosis of FASD because it will identify what other conditions they live with and it will also, um, it will also identify what is the best, best intervention plan. Now, when we do nothing and we don't have diagnosis, we know from the evidence that the average lifespan for those with FASD is 34 years of age. Now, FASD is a unique disability. The reason why is because naturally there's so much stigma. We've talked about stigma yesterday as well, and the blame that is placed on women, and not understanding the underlying causes. So the other, the other area that's really important to recognise in terms of prevention is that often there are families with multiple siblings. So 40% of the time, uh, FASD is generational with multiple siblings within the same family. Australian research by Elizabeth Elliott found that 51% of children diagnosed with FASD were also found to have a sibling with FASD. And 41%, only 41% were living with their biological parents. So this is mental health comorbidity. Okay, stigma plays a huge part, um, lack of awareness of health professionals, but it's right across the sector as well. So child protection is another key player in this as well, as, as is the criminal justice system. So just, I just want to really touch really briefly on this. Um, why is it different for us? Well, because, because of colonisation. So in, um, for... A lot of Aboriginal people, I'll use the example of uh, WA, we had, legal, we had access to alcohol in 1963, but the stolen generations and continued until the 70s. Of course, a lot of our, our people medicated their trauma um, without the knowledge of what was the potential harm to children. 
This is from the Aboriginal Healing Foundation report, and it highlights the, um, the number of descendants from the stolen generations actually is in non-remote areas. And the thing, other thing to note here is that Western Australia was the second hardest hit state in terms of children removed. Okay, and this is another key factor of why this is so critical to address in the Aboriginal community. You can see there um, the majority of our population are under the age of 24. You can see there that our birth rate is double that of um, mainstream Australia. Uh, this is the impact of FASD on this, the actual age there is 18. This is a training slide. Um, but you can see here that the social skills is at the age of seven, okay? So this is something that's really important in terms of informing prevention. Okay, so here's the results of, this, of the study that I did. Um, this beautiful artwork was donated by, uh, to me by my um, nephew, Peter Farmer. And um, so this was developed with uh, the Noongar Community Academic Peers Lit Review. Okay, so here were the towns that I went to down south. I had 109 females that took part, and here are the results. Again, important to capture trauma, so I asked this question. Were you or an immediate member of your family part of the stolen generations? The majority said yes. What was your awareness of FASD? Well, whilst 61% said, yes, I've heard of FASD, what we need to take, um, pay attention to is that only 10% are confident in their knowledge. Where did they receive information on FASD? Um, you can see there the, that the majority had heard from either a family member um, or a health nurse, GP, health worker. Do you know anyone that drinks alcohol during pregnancy? 67.8% said yes. Do you think it's common to drink alcohol during pregnancy? 32% said yes. That, that figure there has also been um, backed up by um, another researcher by the name of Popova. Is anyone in your family possibly have FASD? 37.8% said yes. This is the kind of information that the community were asking for that they'd like to receive. Um, basic information. You can see their prevention, 47%, all of the above, 42%. The cultural secure way to deliver uh, FASD. This is a very sensitive topic for all communities, and this is what the community said was their preferred ways. This is, I just wanted to put this up here because this is one of the, the best evidence-based um, thera therapeutic programs in working with women at risk. And uh, so I'm just, just putting it up there. The point I want to make is that any interventions um, for high-risk families have to be long-term. Okay, so here is so best practice moving forward. Um, again, FASD diagnosis is the gold standard. Training, training and more training. Um, working in consultation with people who do know this area is really critical. Um, mental health, we need to be FASD informed. We need to be FASD informed in child protection. Um, Diagnosis is also important because we can also access NDIS. Still hit and miss, but um, there has been some good stories there. So the other thing too is that, um, like every other area, the economic benefits of putting in the resources and the diagnosis early will save us billions across um, the lifespan. This has also been costed out as well. It costs. It costs a quarter of a million dollars to put a child into juvenile detention centre. So I'm taking this, this quote from um, one of the carers, and what she says here is that the ultimate cost on the wider community is going to be far more. Put the hard yards in now, and spend the money now whilst they are young. Put infrastructures in place to support them and encourage them and look after them. <clears throat> Why are they forced onto families who can't cope? Thank you.
Thank you very much. Yeah, I am a very grateful recipient of uh, Jean Hale's Travel Fellowship. Thank you, Jean Hale's. So, uh, fertility and preconception health promotion is really a window of opportunity to improve not only pregnancy outcomes, but also maternal and child health, and also to prevent chronic conditions. So today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a health promotion program relating to fertility and preconception health that I've been involved with for the last uh, eight years now, actually. So by way of background, there are a number of potentially modifiable factors that do affect reproductive outcomes, but also they uh, increase the risk of health problems. One estimate is that up to 50% of cases of infertility is associated with these factors. So to prevent infertility and reduce the risk of chronic conditions in women and their offspring, the Commonwealth Government funded fertility and preconception health promotion, Your Fertility, was established in 2011. This program has two target audiences. One is the general public, people of reproductive age, and the other is health and education professionals. So the program is delivered by um, a consortium of organizations called the Fertility Coalition. The Victorian Assisted Reproductive Treatment Authority is the lead agency, and we collaborate with Healthy Male, which used to be the um, uh, called Andrology Australia, the Robinson Research Institute, Jean Hales, and Monash University. So as we got started in 2011, we decided on five focus areas. The first one being that we wanted to conduct our own research so that we had our own evidence to inform the program. We wanted to have a user-friendly website because that was going to be our, most, uh, our platform for communication with our target audiences. We wanted to hold community events from time to time. And we really wanted to uh, develop a lot of resources for health and education professionals to strengthen their capacity to engage with, with fertility and preconception health promotion. And then to improve the reach and increase the reach of, of all our messages, we wanted to establish partnerships and collaborations with, with organizations with similar um, interests. So, um, firstly, uh, really we wanted to get a handle on what people of reproductive, of reproductive age know about the factors that affect um, fertility and preconception health. So we conducted one qualitative and one quantitative study, and, and there were studies uh, among people of reproductive age who had said that they did want to have a child now or in the future. And really, both of these studies came up with the same findings, and that's that there are considerable knowledge gaps uh, among people of reproductive age about fertility. Uh, the most staggering one, I think, was that most people underestimated by about 10 years the age when fertility starts to decline. But there was also a, a lot, of, lot of unawareness about the fact that both obesity and smoking affect fertility and, and pregnancy health outcomes. Uh, quite a few people were not too sure about when in the menstrual cycle a woman is able to conceive, so they didn't quite know about the, the fertile window. And we did find that um, most people actually do use the internet to, um, to find health information, not just in general, but, but specifically about sexual and reproductive health. So these two studies informed the development and the content of our website. And it's been built over time, but by now it really has a lot to offer people who look for information about fertility and preconception health. And we do this in a range of formats, as you can see here. And because we know now that the health of the male partner is also important for fertility and pregnancy health, all the information we have is, is explicitly male-inclusive. And partly this is because we want to avoid placing all the responsibility for fertility and pregnancy health on women. And the website also has a, uh, a whole section dedicated to health and education professionals where we have resources specific to their needs. This is the home page. Uh, it's been revamped recently, and um, yeah, this is what you find when you go to the Your Fertility on the home page. We do monitoring, of course, of the traffic to the website, and as you can see here, we have quite a, a good reach by now, we think. We have over three and, three and a half million visits to the website every year, and interestingly enough, it's the, the timing page, which is a page that describes the fertile window in the menstrual cycle that, that gets the most views. So in relation to the second focus area of staging community events, this has mainly been the launching of annual, the annual Fertility Week. And this is where we pick a particular topic that we hope is going to generate 
uh, general interest and media interest, of course, and that this in turn will drive traffic to the website and all the information we have there. And as you can see here, we've covered quite a lot of topics over the years. We've also identified some key components to success, and we of course need to have a newsworthy topic that the media is going to like and, and, and come to us to find out more about. We always want to involve an identifiable and well-spoken expert in the field who can help us with media interviews. We always want to have consumers, meaning just real people who, who might be likely to need this information. And uh, if you find the right people, they are a great attraction to the media. They always want talent. <laughs> We always release something new, of course, in conjunction with Fertility Week, and we use as much as we can both social and traditional media. Now, next on our list of priorities was to engage with health and education professionals because we really wanted to increase that capacity to promote fertility and preconception health. And again, we did some research because we wanted to know more about their attitudes and practices uh, relating to what they do currently in their, uh, when they talk to people of reproductive age. So, uh, the first study we did was with um, practice nurses. We surveyed them about whether they ever talked to people about fertility and preconception health. We also spoke to survey, uh, surveyed maternal and child and health nurses. And lastly, just recently, we published this paper where we spoke to or um, surveyed GPs about whether they ever talked to, to men uh, in their practice about um, pregnancy intention, preconception care. Uh, and so forth. And really, the three studies confirm the same thing. They say that most primary healthcare professionals, they really believe it is part of their role to talk about fertility and preconception health. Uh, they really uh, say that they don't feel that they know enough. And they also feel a bit uh, worried about bringing it up with people because they're not sure how it's going to be received. So they, they have trouble starting the conversation. They universally say that they would like more education on the topic, and they also want really good, credible, evidence-based resources that they can, they can send their patients to. So in response to this, we have then, of course, developed a range of resources for health professionals, firstly. Uh, for example, in collaboration with Jean Hales, we've produced webinars and online learning modules, and uh, these are all about fertility and preconception health promotion, and they've been quite widely viewed by uh, GPs and others. And then in collaboration with Family Planning Victoria, we developed a teaching aid, and this is really to help teachers include concepts like fertility protection and reproductive life planning in their sexual and reproductive health education. And just a few weeks ago, and in collaboration with the Australian Primary Nurses Association, we launched an online learning module on preconception health promotion for primary healthcare nurses. And then last on our agenda was to establish partnerships with organizations with overlapping interests. And to date, we have partnered with more than 30 organizations, including the ones you can see on this slide. And that has really propelled the, the um, reach of our messages. And I think it, it's been very productive uh, in lots of ways. And then finally, to promote the existence of this program internationally, we published this paper where we described how we developed the program and what the program had achieved in the first five years. So we conclude that the research we've done and the data we've collected, and it's now been eight years, it really shows that uh, this program does meet a need for what, what we believe is important and targeted evidence-based and accessible fertility-related health information. And this is just to acknowledge all the people who've been instrumental in getting this program going. Thank you very much. I'm glad I didn't <laughs> talk too much. <laughs> You've heard the panelists' thoughts on this. Catherine. To summarise in two sentences. Um, so we know that context obviously matters and it matters a great deal for prevention of um, ill health. Um, and we all importantly know that there's a huge number of strategies coming out uh, over the next, you know, last couple of years and next couple of years as well as implementation plans. So it's really important that we really developed a cohesive and coordinated strategy for the women's health strategy that integrates all of these strategies as well as leveraging off the current systems that we have in place 
recognising there's changes that need to happen, but we've got a system in place that we need to work with, um, and I think that's really important. And it's also important that we progress and we innovate over time and we look at evidence-based mechanisms for measuring that and making sure that we, we leverage off the technology that comes into place to make sure we're communicating with people in the best way. Thank you, and congratulations. That was very well done.